Luke chapter 6, verses 24 through 49. Verses 24 and 25. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Burkett notes, observe here, one, that though St. Luke omits diverse of the Beatitudes mentioned by St. Matthew, chapter 5, yet he reciteth the woes which St. Matthew admitteth. If we will understand our Savior's doctrine fully, we must consult all the evangelists thoroughly. Observe, too, these woes are not to be understood absolutely, but restrainedly. The woes do not belong to men because they're rich, because they're full, because they do laugh, but because they place their happiness in these things, take up with them for their portions, and rejoice in them as their chief good, valuing themselves by what they have in hand, not by what they have in hope. He that is rich and righteous, he that is great and gracious, he that has his hands full of this world and his heart empty of pride and vain confidence, he that laughs when God smiles, he that expresses himself joyfully when God expresses himself graciously, such a man is rich in grace, who is thus gracious in the midst of riches. For to be rich and holy argues much riches of holiness. Verse 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Burkett notes, Our Savior's design in these words is not to condemn any of his disciples or ministers who have, by doing their duty, gained a fair reputation among the men of the world, but to let us understand how rarely and seldom it is attended, for usually the best of men are the worst spoken of. Neither the prophets of the Old Testament, nor John the Baptist, the prophet of the New Testament, nor Christ himself, nor his apostles, did ever gain either the good will or the good word of the men of that generation in which they lived. The applause of the multitude, that contingent judge of good and evil, rather attains to the vain than the virtuous. None have ever been so much reproached by man as the faithful ministers of God, who have learned to take pleasure in reproaches. For though grace does not bid us invite reproaches, yet it teaches us to bid them welcome. The world has all along taken effectual care by their cruel mockings, bitter reproaches, sharp invectives, to free the ministers of God in all ages from the danger of our Savior's woe denounced here. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Verses 27 through 29. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smites thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that take away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Burkett notes, Observe here, one, the noble spirit of Christianity and the large extent of Christian charity. The Jewish kindness was limited and confined to those of their own religion, kindred, and nation. Their charity began and ended at home. But our Savior obliges his followers to the exercise of a more extensive charity, even to all mankind, even to the worst of men, our enemies that seek our destruction. Christianity is so far from allowing us to persecute them that hate us, that it commands us to love them that persecute us. Observe, too, the nature and quality of the duty enjoined. Love your enemies. There, the inward affection is required. Bless them that curse you. There, outward civility and affability is required. Do good to them that hate you. Here, real acts of kindness and beneficence are required to be done to the worst of enemies, though they be guilty of the worst of crimes, calumny, and cruelty, striking both at our reputation and our life. Learn that Christianity obliges us to bear a sincere love to our most malicious enemies, to be ready at all times to pray for them, and upon all occasions to do good unto them. Thus to do is an imitation of God, our Maker, of Christ, our Master. It is for the good of this lower world, and the way to a better. It is the ornament of our religion, and the perfection of our nature, and a high degree and pitch of virtue, to which may be added the next duty, not to revenge injuries, where private revenge is the thing forbidden, and we are directed rather to suffer a double wrong than to seek a private revenge. Christianity obliges us to bear many injuries patiently, rather than to revenge one privately. We must leave the matter to God and the magistrate. The truth is, 
Revenge is a very troublesome and vexatious passion. The man's soul swells and boils, and is in pain and anguish, and has no ease. Besides, by our avenging of one injury, we necessarily draw on another, and so bring on a perpetual circulation of injuries and revenges. Whereas forgiveness prevents vexation to others, disquietment to ourselves. Verse 30. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Burkett notes, These and the like precepts of our saviors are not to be taken strictly, but restrainedly. We are thereby obliged to charity according to others' necessity, and our own abilities, but not bound to give to everyone that has the confidence to ask for what we have. Indeed, every man that really wants is the proper object of our Christian charity. And we must, with a compassionate heart and open hand, relieve him according to his necessity, but answerable to our ability. Nor must the second part of the verse be understood as forbidding Christians to seek the recovery of their just rights by pursuing thieves and following the law upon oppressors, but requiring us to forbear all acts of private revenge, as directly contrary to the spirit and temper of Christianity. As jealousy is the rage of a man, so revenge is the rage of the devil. It is the very soul and spirit of the apostate nature. Verse 31. And as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Burkett notes, Here our Savior lays down a most excellent rule of life for all his disciples and followers to walk by, namely, always to do as we would be done by. The golden rule of justice and equity in all our dealings with men is this, to do as we would be done unto. It is a full rule, a clear rule, a most just and equitable rule, which the light of nature and the law of Christ binds upon us. St. Matthew chapter 7, 14 adds that this is the law and the prophets, that is, the sum of the Old Testament and the substance of the second table. The whole of the law is this, to love God above ourselves and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Verses 32 through 36 For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Burkett notes, The design of our blessed Savior in all and every of these precepts is to recommend unto us all sorts and kinds of mercy and charity, namely, charity in giving, charity in forgiving, charity in lending. It is sometimes our duty, if we have the ability, to lend to such poor persons as we cannot expect will ever be in a capacity either to repay or to requite us. This is to imitate the divine bounty, which does good to all, even to the unthankful and to the unholy. Love for love is justice. Love for no love is favor and kindness. But love and charity, mercy and compassion to all persons, even the undeserving and the ill-deserving, This is a divine goodness, a Christ-like temper, which will render us illustrious on earth and glorious in heaven. St. Luke says here, Be ye merciful, as your Father is merciful. St. Matthew says, chapter 5, last verse, Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect, implying that love and mercy, charity and compassion, is the perfection of a Christian's graces. He that is made perfect in love is perfect in all divine graces in the account of God. Perfection in graces, but especially in love and charity, ought to be our aim in this life, and shall be our attainment in the next. Verse 37. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Burkett notes, this prohibition, judge not, is not to be understood of ourselves, but of our neighbors. Self-judging is a great and necessary duty. Rash judging of others is a heinous and grievous sin, which exposes to the righteous judgment of God. It is private judging and private condemning of persons which God forbids. It follows, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. 
Not that a bare forgiving of all others is all that God requires in order to your forgiveness, but it is one part of that obedience which we owe to God, without which it is in vain to expect forgiveness from God. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. See the note on Matthew 7, 1. Verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Burkett notes, I think there is not any one text of Scripture that declares the bounty of God more fully in rewarding acts of charity and mercy than this before us. Oh, how liberal a paymaster is God! Oh, how sure and bountiful are the returns Christ makes to us for the relief given to him and his members. He promises us here, one, not bare measure, but good measure. Two, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Nothing adds more to the measure than the shaking of the bushel, the crowding and pressing of the corn, and heaping till the measure runneth over. Now a measure will run over as long as you will pour. Learn hence the charities done in faith, in obedience to God, and with an eye to the glory of God, will produce a certain and plentiful increase. Liberality is the way to riches. Giving is the best and surest way of thriving. A little charity from us, if we have built up but a little, is looked upon by God as a great deal. But it is the greatest imprudence, as well as impiety, to do but a little when we have the ability to do much. For he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Good measure pressed down and running over. Verse 39. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Merquet notes, Our Savior doubtless applied these words to the scribes and Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, doctors, and teachers, who, being ignorant of the spiritual sense of the law, interpreting it only to the restraining of the outward man, were very unfit to instruct and lead others. For where one blind man leads another, both are in danger of the ditch. That is, to run into ruin and destruction. Learn one, that ignorant, erroneous, and unfaithful ministers are the greatest plague and the sorest punishment that can befall a people. 1. That Christ, having forewarned us of such guides, to follow them will be an inexcusable sin and folly, and never free us from the danger of destruction, but rather be an aggravation of our condemnation. If the blind follow the blind, both will, inevitably, yet inexcusably, fall into the ditch. Verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. Burkett notes, The application of these words, no doubt, our Savior intended to his own disciples, partly to comfort them under suffering and partly to encourage them to obedience. Did they suffer hard things from an unkind world? The remembrance of what their master suffered before them may support them. Did they meet with hard and difficult duties, such as loving enemies, doing good to them that hate and persecute them, their Lord's example may encourage and instruct them, who loved them when they were enemies, who prayed for his murderers, and offered up his blood to God on behalf of them that shed it. Learn hence that the perfection of a Christian in this world consists in the imitation of Christ Jesus, in being as our Master, in coming as near to his example as it is possible for persons clothed with flesh and blood to arrive at. Everyone that is perfect must be as his master. Verses 41 and 42. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. Burkett notes, By the mote in our brother's eye is meant some small and little sin discerned, or some sin suspected. By the beam in our own eye, some greater sin undiscerned. Now, says our Savior, there is no greater sin of hypocrisy than to be curious in spying out the smaller faults of others, and at the same time indulge greater in ourselves. Learn hence, that there is no such way to teach us charity in judging of others as to exercise severity in judging of ourselves. 2. 
that those who desire others should look upon their failings with a compassionate eye must not look upon the failings of others with a censorious eye. For with what measures we met, it shall be measured to us again. Verses 43 through 45. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of the thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Burkett notes, Our Savior here and elsewhere frequently compares persons to trees. The heart of the man is as the root, the actions as the fruit. As the root is the principle from which the fruit springs, so the heart of a man is the principle from which all human actions flow. A holy heart will be accompanied with a holy life. Where there is a vital principle of grace within, there will be the acting of grace without. A good conscience will be accompanied with a good conversation. Observe farther, a double treasure discovered in the heart of man. One, an evil treasure of sin and corruption, from whence flows evil things. But why should sin be called a treasure? not from the preciousness of it, but for the abundance of it. A little doth not make a treasure, and also for the continuance of it. For though sin be perpetually overflowing in the life, yet doth the heart continue full. The treasure of the original corruption in man's heart and nature, though by sanctifying grace it will be drawn low, yet it is never in this life drawn dry. 1. Here is a good treasure of grace discovered in a sanctified and renewed man which is the source and spring from whence all gracious actions do proceed and flow, namely, a sanctified and renewed heart and nature. When once the will of man is made comfortable to the will of God, it doth will and desire, choose and embrace, take pleasure and delight in what God approves, commands, and loves, and it will lay an injunction upon all the members of the body to act conformably thereunto. Verses 46 through 49. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, and digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth, and doth not, is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Burkett notes, Our Savior here concludes his sermon with an elegant solemnitude. He compares the faithful doer of the word to a wise builder, which founded his house upon a rock. Others he resembles to a foolish builder that built his house upon the sand, the house is the hope of heaven and eternal life. The rock is Christ. The building upon the sand is resting upon the bare performance of outward duties. The rain, the wind, the floods are all kinds of afflicting evils, sufferings, and persecutions that may befall us. The sum is, man's hope of salvation built upon any other besides Christ, or built upon Christ without a sincere and uniform obedience to him, are vain hopes, deceitful hopes. For when the storm arises, when affliction or persecution comes, their confidence will fail them, their foundation will be shaken. Learn, one, that the obedient believer is the only wise man that builds his hopes of heaven upon a sure and abiding foundation. Christ is the rock that he builds upon, and one Christ is before a thousand creatures. One rock, better than a million of sands to build upon. Two, that such professors as rest in the bare performance of outward duties are foolish builders. Their foundation is weak and sandy, and all their hopes of salvation vain and deceitful. Lord, how does the carnal world build all their hopes upon the sand, on the wisdom of the flesh, on their policies, counsels, friends, and riches? They bottom their very soul upon fancies, presumptions, delusions, and vain hopes. They expect to be happy without being holy, which is to expect to be easy without being healthy. Woe to that man whose portion lies in the creature's hands, who builds all his hopes upon this earth, 
For when the earth is shaken, his hopes are shaken, his heart is shaken, and he is even at his wit's end. Whereas the Christian that builds upon the rock stands firm and sure. For if ever the Christian falls, Christ must fall with him. He shall never be disappointed of his hopes, unless faithfulness can disappoint. He shall never be deceived, unless truth itself can deceive. If it be impossible for God to lie, then it is impossible for the obedient, holy, and circumspect Christian finally to miscarry.